Good morning, everyone. All right. In our psalm that we read this morning, we were encouraged to come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. And we are invited to come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So on this uh, service of Thanksgiving, um, we're looking at the passage from the Ephesians, uh, which is titled Thanksgiving and Prayer. But before we do that, um, all good academics know that you start with the definition. So um, I did just that. And I went to uh, the Google and I Googled Thanksgiving and was bombarded with pumpkins and autumn leaves and pumpkin pie. And I went, oh, no, I have to narrow my search a little bit. So I went to the Oxford English Dictionary and I put in Thanksgiving. And I got this. Thanksgiving was defined as the giving of thanks, the expression of thankfulness or gratitude, or the act of giving thanks to God. I thought, excellent. Um, I'm pretty sure when I was at school I got told I couldn't define something by using the word that I was trying to define. So I thought, well, this is interesting. So I had to go a little bit deeper and I had to look at what the OED said was the definition of thanks. And you can see it on the slide. It was to express gratitude or obligation to. And that is exactly what we're here today to consider on this Thanksgiving Sunday. We are here to offer worship in music, song, in our resources, to bow before him and to acknowledge as his people here together that he is our God. So, and we're going to look at, as I said, the first, um, the letter to the church in Ephesus. At the beginning of today's passage, the editors of the Bible have titled the passage Thanksgiving and Prayer. Um, the first thing we need to note about this is it is not actually a prayer. There are many places where Paul writes down his prayer, but this part is actually Paul telling us what he is praying for. So it's not actually his prayer, but what he's telling the church what he's praying for. And what does he tell them? Paul says that it, it is in the knowledge granted through the spirit of wisdom and revelation that the church might know him better. Paul is telling the church in Ephesus this um, before, sorry, before Paul tells us how they might go about knowing him better, how he's praying that they might know him better. In verse 15, Paul tells us as to how he has confidence to pray this prayer to the church. So Paul actually starts with a few um, clarifying features about who he's writing to in order to say, this is how I have confidence to pray what I'm going to pray. We see these things in verse 15. We are told that the prayer is directed to the church. Paul then further unpacks this by clarifying what he means by the church, where he says it is believers in the Lord Jesus Christ under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul then expands on this by addressing a few features or characteristics associated with the Ephesian church um, that makes them the believers in Lord Jesus Christ. And these, I think, are important for us to consider here. And so again, we're looking at verse 15. If you have that open in front of you, that might help you. But the, the two evidences that Paul mentions in verse 15 are faith in the Lord Jesus and love for all God's people. So let's have a think about some of these things. The first evidence, faith in the Lord Jesus. The very first thing we should note about this evidence or this characteristic that Paul is stating about this church is that it is mentioned first. It is faith only in the Lord Jesus that saves us, that makes us Christian. Later in the book, in chapter 2, Paul notes, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, 
not by works so that no one can boast. Faith only in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first evidence. The second evidence that we're given follows on or flows out of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and it is your love for all God's people. Paul here is selecting love for all believers as the specific illustration or evidence of this aforementioned faith. It is love for all God's people that Paul is using as evidence of how the gospel of Jesus Christ has changed their, our hearts. So after this introductory section where Paul gives thanks for their faith in the church and their love for all believers, Paul goes on to unpack how he is praying that the church might know him better. Um, and the academic in me likes that there are three points. So Paul, you know, I'm sure when Paul was talking, he was like, ah, oh, Del's going to really like this in two and a half thousand years later because there'll be three points that she can unpack. It's brilliant. So thank you, Paul. Paul says there are three things that will help us know him better. The first is the hope of his calling. The second is the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And the third is the incomparably great power of God available to us. So let's start with one and two. We're going to look at one and two. They're both in verse 18. The hope of his calling and the riches of his glorious inheritance. The hope that Paul is mentioning here has a sense of confident expectation, assurance and boldness. This hope is in contrast to the lack of hope that Paul gives us in um, the other parts of Ephesians. So in Ephesians 2, chapter 12, Paul says, Remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. In Ephesians um, chapter 4, verses 17 to 19, Paul again unpacks this lack of hope by saying, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from their life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. So that's the hopelessness, that's the contrasted hopelessness. But what is the hope? In verse 18, Paul says, I pray that your eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his inglorious inheritance in his holy people. The Apostle Peter, in his book 1 Peter, in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, further unpacks this idea of hope, in which he says, and you can see it on the screen, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never spoil, that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. What is this hope? And the answer is it is the future purpose or inheritance for which God has called us who believe in Jesus Christ. It is the hope of God's calling, the hope of new birth, an inheritance in heaven, all gained through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now this, this hope and inheritance are expressed throughout much of the New Testament, much, much of the Bible. I mean, that's not really going to be um, surprising to us. Um, it's the big work that God is um, doing. But the hope and inheritance, we're going to look at a few verses. So in Matthew 13, verse 30, verses 43, we are told, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And Revelation 3, verse 21. To the one who is victorious, 
I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. What a hope. All these passages so God's called people enjoying eternal life in paradise with him. There's a few things that we have to just be careful of when we get to this concept of the hope of his calling. We've jumped in to chapter 15 in Ephesians, but obviously there's a bit before that, verses 1 to 11, just in case you were wondering. So in verses 11 to 15, well, 11 to 14, which we haven't read today um, of chapter 1, Paul makes it very clear that we are Christian believers of God because God has chosen us. It is a relationship with God via grace through faith. In these verses, we are reminded that we are not Christians because of any inherent quality we possess. It is not because we are smart, strong, good or wise. Rather, it is because God loved us in spite of the fact that we are not smart, strong, good or wise. But more than this, we are then given the privilege of being God's called to become his witness into the world. It is through us that God is showing the world that salvation does not consist of smarts, wisdom, strengths, or morality. Rather, salvation comes through Jesus, our Saviour, who saved us by being weak and broken on a cross. And this is one of the most outstanding truths that we grasp, that God, the maker and owner of the universe, has bound up his inheritance with us. Our inheritance is bound with the creator of the universe. We no longer strive for worldly status. Rather, our status is now linked with the Father Almighty. This is Paul's prayer, that through the Holy Spirit we receive wisdom, revelation and enlightenment that we may know these things in a deeper and more meaningful way. Paul prays that the church receives this wonderful truth and through the converting work of the Holy Spirit we begin to comprehend these truths and appreciate and experience them to a fuller measure. Preacher Dr Martin Lloyd-Jones says of this passage that the degree to which we understand this, we will receive strength not to sin. By drawing on this as inspiration for self-control, we inherit a desire to become sinless and to strive to a deeper relationship with Christ. Do you know this? Do we know this? Do we really know this? Do we give thanks for this? If we can truly grasp that we are the chosen of God, if this hope infuses us so deeply that we can see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, if we can begin to grasp what it actually means to be God's called to receive the glorious riches of his inheritance, if we grasp this in our hearts, then we can be sent into the world with this hope of his calling. And as we take this hope out into the world, it changes who we are. When we see a non-Christian, we no longer approach them with any superiority. We do not say, we cannot say, we are better than this person, because we now approach the non-Christian with polite submission and respect. We know they are not better than us, actually. We do, not earn any, we do not do anything to earn our Christian status. And indeed, the non-Christian, might be, might, they might be better than us. We cannot say, we, we do not say, that person will never be a Christian. They're not the Christian type. And we know that that's not the case because we aren't the Christian type. Rather, it is God's grace and God's calling, which means that there is hope for all. And this hope is what we have been given the privilege to share. So what a wonderful place to start our Thanksgiving service. So I want to ask you at this point, what would you give thanks for? 
In reflecting on this passage so far, there's a number of things I think we could give hope, thanks, we could give thanks to God for. We could thank God for the hope of call, hope, God for the hope in calling us. We can thank God for the gift of his Holy Spirit as we gain a deeper wisdom and knowledge about what his saving grace means. We can thank God for the purpose in the world given to us through our calling in Christ. We could thank God for the privilege of being his people in this world. And we can certainly thank God for the riches of his glorious inheritance. That's the first two parts of Paul's prayer, the hope of his calling and the riches of his glorious inheritance. But there's, you know, that's pretty good, but there's a third bit. There's another bit. You thought the first two were good. Well, strap in. The third point that Paul prays so that we may know God better is that his incomparable power made available to us. It is God's desire that we should know, that we should become acquainted with, that we should rely upon this awesome and measurable power of his. And what is this power? Check this out. It's the power that resurrected Christ from the dead. It's the power that broke open a sealed tomb. The power that raised Jesus' body to renewed Jesus' dead body to renewed vitality. And it's the power that transformed not only the restored body of Jesus, but also changed it into a new glorious being, a new creation. It is the power that gives life. It is in this power that everything under God's feet, God's work, God's plans, absolutely every part of history is done for us to save us and to ensure a right relationship between us and our Heavenly Father. We've given further examples of what this power can accomplish. Let's have a look at Colossians verses one, chap, uh, chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, where we're told, so that you may live a life worthy of of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. By the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And Philippians 4, 4 verse 12 to 13. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every and any situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in, want, or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Through God's awesome power available to us, we can live with the peace of knowing the power of God. It's upon us. It saves us. It works through us. It changes us. It keeps us in him. In verse 19, Paul does actually say that the power brought to us by faith is available for us who believe. Now, I do not know Greek. Um, sorry, I've done some other study in my life, but not that. Um, but the commentaries say that the Greek word being used in here in verse 19 is it's the verb to believe, and it's in its present tense. And I think this is important because this is indicating that the power available to us requires a present ongoing, active faith in Christ. It's a faith that depends on Christ as saviour day by day. It is in this that his divine power is experienced. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, we read, we thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is 
the word of God, which is at, indeed at work in you who believe. Paul is praying for the Ephesian church, for the church here, in accordance with God's desire, that you may know this awesome power of God in their, in our everyday life. So again, I ask you, what shall we give thanks for? We could thank God that his awesome power is made available to us who believe. We could pray that our lives be characterised by this active faith, a faith that experiences and witnesses this awesome power. And Paul closes with the final manifestation of the power of Christ. And we see this in verses 22 and 23. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So our final um, reminder about what this power is, is that it rules everything for the church. Christ is the head of the church. The power of Christ gives him a sovereign status. All will be subordinated to the exalted Christ. In the fullness of him, he fills and empowers the church. It is this glory of Christ that is what makes the church what it is supposed to be. And it's even more than that. It is that he fills everything in every way. Christ's power fills all all the universe. He creates, sustains and pervades the universe with his presence. He upholds everything. He governs all things by his omnipresent power. Again in Colossians 1 verses 16 to 18 we are told, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. All Christian living rests on the person and work of Christ. By his work and through his power, the church operates transforming the lives of its members through this resurrection power. The Lord uses the church to manifest his glory. Christ fills the church with his sovereign care and his blessings. So, for our Thanksgiving service, what would you like to thank God for? What do you thank God for regarding the work of Christ? What do you thank God for regarding the work of the church? Let me close by reading uh, an actual prayer that Paul writes from chapter 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is this love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Sing with joy now. Our God is.